Welcome. This is the uh, final session of the MOOC on Managing Responsibly. Uh, in today's session, we are going to look at the different ways in which uh, the parts uh, of materials that we presented to you uh, in the last weeks uh, can be connected. And as you uh, probably uh, un already understand by now, uh, if we talk about sustainability, about ethics and about responsibility, uh, there are many dimensions uh, that, that you can look at. And over the past few weeks, we have all the time looked at specific pieces uh, to be able to present you the basic materials uh, for this. Uh, but of course, in real life, these things, they happen at the same time and you need to somehow balance them uh, in the situation uh, where you are working. And as much as it is possible in a session like this, uh, Oliver, Sally and me, we are going to try and show you the different connections that we make in the material uh, that we have provided to you. And that is an invitation to you to also look at this material again. Uh, so go back to the interviews, go back to uh, preceding lectures, go back to the, uh, the other materials that we've given to you and see for yourself where you can make uh, sort of connections between the different levels from individual to organization to the global system or between sustainability and ethics or responsibility and ethics or responsibility and sustainability. So this is the work that we want to do in this uh, last session and that uh, we hope sets you up for uh, doing the final assessment and uh, it will also help you uh, to develop your competences uh, beyond uh, this MOOC in your actual job. Sally, do you want to tell us a little bit more about how we're going to uh, do this? Yes, yeah, so in the, during the last six weeks, we've been also interviewing practitioners as part of this MOOC. Mm -hmm. I think that's quite different and unusual Basically, we're trying to get the voices of practitioners on the topics that we're interested in, mm. but they don't speak in the same kind of fragmented boxes that we've had to deliver our MOOC through. So when we interview people, they bring through all these connecting themes quite naturally. Um, so what we'd like people to do is go back over those 10 or so interviews and look, use that as our material that we've used to draw out some connecting themes. And we are going to organise this session around the connections that we see from illustrations that we have through those interviews. That's how we're going to do this session. Yeah. So um, what we did, in fact, is we, we reviewed those interviews and we pulled out six themes uh, that struck us that give some examples, and there are many more, of how our material connects in different ways. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could look at those uh, six themes just very quickly and then that will structure uh, the, the kind of following conversation. Yep. So our, our first connecting theme is about individuals and organisations. So we will look at how what people say about their individual uh, work links to their organisational perspective. The second links organisations and systems. So what happens in individual organisations links to what happens at the systemic level. And then we found that a few of our interviewees talked about different temporalities and different um, scales. So local, global, organisational and how they kind of um, interact at, at different levels. Um, another theme that we can draw out from all the interviews is about diversity. And we had a number of interviews from different parts of the world. Um, and that naturally takes us into thinking about the global level, differences in culture, differences in bis business practices, and how things are done differently around the world. Um, we have a theme that is about power structures and tensions. So even though we might like things to be smooth and easy to achieve, we all know that the world is very complicated and full of tensions and, and power relationships. So we can draw some of that out of the interviews. And the final one is about people's individual careers, the pathways that they've been on so far in their careers, and that how that helps people watching the MOOC to 
connect what we hear in our interviewees' um, storylines to their own lives and, 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 and where they're going in their career. Mm -hmm. So if we were to take the first theme that we drew from the interview material, um, we were looking at the connections between individuals and organisations, and I think, Oliver, you had a few things to say about that. Yeah. Um, I think particularly the interview with uh, Pierre Poppenreiter from the, the startup Olala uh, was very interesting in that respect because what happened there was actually that um, she as founder of the company was very, very concerned about how her values actually are reflected in the organization that she was creating. So from the very beginning they were actually trying to manage, trying to somehow steer that towards a uh, consistency between between who she is and uh, who the people work in the team are and what the organization is. Um, so that she was talking about how important the code of ethics actually was from the very beginning, shaping um, the company. And she was talking about different meetings they were doing in order to discuss potential issues and to talk about their values and how everything comes together. Uh, and finally, also um, to think about what or who are the the people that actually can reflect those values and those ethics of the organization when they were hiring. So I think that's something that's very interesting. I think that's something that uh, also was present possibly in some of the other interviews. Yeah, and for sure, I think what's interesting is when an organization's values shapes the employees then and how they act and behave in the organization. So the point you make about codes of conduct is really interesting. So. I know, for example, Rolls-Royce have a code of conduct of ethics, which actually facilitates and, and encourages whistleblowing. So there's an activity or a behavior um, which is around ethics, but in fact the organization doesn't just reflect the values of the staff and employees, it actually shapes them because it facilitates and enables enables staff and employees to behave in a particular way, uh, in, in a way that's consistent with the values of the organization. Um, but then also I think at the systems level, when you start to get the idea that Mary Gentili brought in about supranorms, so that asks the question, is there, a, is there even a cross-cultural set of norms of ethics and behavior that if you like, uh, you know, institutionally, uh, human rights uh, may, may be culturally specified, but there may be a kind of a, a standard that is, is approved or is, is generic or, you know, this is, this is a debate whether or not there are universal supernorms. And Mary in her interview seemed to feel that wherever she worked, whether in India, South America uh, and Europe, there were some supernorms. So that's quite interesting, I think, when we move to the systems level um, as, as to the connection in ethics terms between the individual, the organization and system level. Um, and but what, 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 would, what would that then mean for people like in a, in a practical situation, you know, because for me the super norms, I mean, I find it attractive, the idea, but it's also a bit difficult to actually see how people, you know, who are sort of participating in the MOOC, how they could apply or sort of work with that idea in their own practice. Do you, do you have any thoughts about it? Well, so that, I that is a debate. And I think what Mary suggested, um, so the other side of what she was saying in her interview was um, for the leaders of organizations where a particular um, ethics is, is maybe compromised, such as uh, bribes or, or mm -hmm. uh, corruption, um, she had some examples which were kind of different to the idea of supernorms, which said that um, the leaders of the organization can actually help their employees to um, counteract those cultural tendencies mm -hmm. towards fraud or um, bribes or whatever in very simple ways, like not uh, putting their employees in a position where they may, might be tempted to take bribes from external. So I think it kind of comes back down the ladder again to say um, not always are there super norms and in fact the cultural context of ethics is very important mm. to how organizations yeah. behave. Yeah. So that in fact would um, <coughs> would be the opposite idea of universal yeah. super norms. Yeah. So and the next theme is about organizations affecting system levels. So this is basically about the idea that uh, and for me, this is something that almost immediately I, 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 the word uncertainty comes up. 
uh, in the sense that, you know, thinking about sustainability, then, then one of the big challenges, I would say, is that you are working within an organization, uh, sometimes even a part of, of an organization that you really know very well. Uh, and then sustainability very quickly leads you into discussions and debates and questions that are about global problems. Um, and then one of the major connections that you somehow have to make is how does my behavior relate to that big problem, yes? And one of the ways, of course, to make that sort of uh, uh, decision is to say, okay, you know, what I'm doing or what we are doing is just a small part, so it doesn't really matter. But of course, if everybody thinks like that, then the problem will never uh, uh, be solved or be resolved in any way. Um, but if you do want to think about the consequences of what you're doing and how you might be able to change something, then it's, it's quite difficult to actually see how that, you know, how that could work. Um, so, and I wonder, do, do we have in our interviews or in the material, you know, do we have people sort of wrestling with that, uh, with that spe specific type of uncertainty? It brings to mind Rainer's interview at yeah. the um, yeah. Institute of Biotechnology, um, where we were having a discussion about the societal implications of synthetic mm -hmm. biology. Yeah. So here we have a new and emerging area <coughs> of science and knowledge, um, where uh, similarly to genetic modification and nanotechnologies, um, the future is uncertain. Mm. And in the face of that uncertainty, what can people do collectively in, in, in group work or participative modes to maybe anticipate or at least debate um, what the implications for those uncertainties are for society. So basically it never stops uncertainty. You can't stop uncertainty, but it, it really brings a lot of people into the discussion as to what the societal implications mm -hmm. um, of technologies down the line might be where we, they c so new technologies can be used for many different applications. They can be used for bioweaponry as easily as they can be used to replace fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, so how we have that debate within collectives, within organizations at an early stage is the point about anticipative governance on mm. the uncertainties of mm. technology and responsibilities <coughs> of um, distributed debates about uh, emerging technologies. Mm. So this connects also then to the, the, the theme in a way that we have about dialogue. Yes, so it's not really about making decisions, but it's more about being in contact with other people and in that sense sort of as the technology develops, stay in contact with other people uh, and in that sense sort of uh, the uncertainty reduces in a way as the technology develops, but then it, it, the uncertainty reduces in a way that is maybe more sustainable than it otherwise would be. And I think that has implications for organizations and this is really an, a new area of research and work that we're interested in which you might call responsible innovation mm -hmm. which is um, how can organizations become involved in in doing these new kind of inclusive techniques and how would they actually systematize processes so that that becomes normalized into the organization um, and I think Rainer's um, interview brought that out really nicely he said we're scientists we don't make decisions about the future of technologies that's done by other actors mm -hmm. um, and therefore how mm. are those actors brought into the dialogue uh, in, at, at an early stage. Mm. Yeah. So this might actually be an interesting connection between this theme and the previous one we had because we've seen a couple of situations where actually individuals started to think about how they could use organizations to, to affect that systemic level. So what Frank said before about what can I do as an organ as, as an individual could be answered in one way saying, well, I could actually start changing, transforming an organization or trying to use an organization to make an impact on that systemic level. So um, on the one hand, we were, th we were hearing from Madeleine Kopp, who actually said, well, she, she moved from work in the governmental and uh, also the NGO sector to work in, in a for-profit company because she thought this is the ki kind of organization that can actually make a big, big impact. Um, and on the other hand, also we've seen how, how Pia said that her organization actually uh, was very sensitive about how society or the external stakeholders think about what they're doing and uh, how they're trying to navigate that very tricky topic that you called it, which is online dating. 
So I think there's there's a couple of more connections that actually can be made as well. Yeah. yeah. Moving on to the third theme. Yeah. So here we thought um, there was a number of the interviews that we did that drew out um, a, a not local to global tensions, but actually tensions in time between short termism and long termism, for example. Mm. Um, and that came out about even the role of the Turkish boss um, and how um, a long-term ethical finance approach can actually help companies to do things in a different way. And that theme came out as well with Koshik's um, interview in South Africa, where he, he's, his view was that a global financial system, which is um, organize, organized around quite a short-term perspective, a short-termism, is quite um, difficult for South African companies to, to cope with because they have many um, difficulties of their own to cope with uh, about kind of rebooting the South African economy and how to work in the South African context. And there, the case study that Koshik brought to us was how um, long -ter a longer-term perspective would help South African companies to be um, more sustainable mm. in, in their work. Mm. And I think um, the, the idea of temporal scale came out there. Uh, um, I think that the, the, the this issue of short-termism is actually quite interesting because in a way it's almost is like the opposite of what you were just talking about. You know, the ability to, as an individual or using the organization as a tool to make change. Uh, because short-termism for me is something that I hear very often as, as a cause uh, of, of problems. You know, the fact that, that, that we don't seem to be really e able to think about the longer term. Uh, and everybody almost complains about this, uh, which basically means that we could change it very easily. So if tomorrow everybody starts thinking in a longer term, then uh, we it wouldn't be a problem anymore. But somehow we are not able to do that. Yeah? So we are keeping each other prisoner almost in this thinking in terms of, of, of a, ve a very short term and even making that short term shorter still. Um, and that might actually be an experience that a lot of people who are watching this have in one way or another, that you have this you know, s sort of expectation of other people uh, which in itself is not really, you know, a very, very strong thing, but because everybody is expecting it, it actually becomes like a structure that is imposed on you and you can't do anything else but sort of give in to it almost. Uh, and I think that in terms of, res you know, managing respons responsibly, that is something that, that you actually walk into quite often uh, because you, you know, in trying to manage responsibly, you basically are aware of things that other people take for granted. Uh, and once you become aware of it, then uh, in a way that's sort of liberating because you, you sort of see alternative ways. But at the same time, it's also uh, quite difficult because it's not always possible to yeah. sort of start that alter alternative uh, course of action. I, I think one... Uh thing that individuals actually can do in that respect mm. as well is um, to start thinking about how to to help create that kind of behavior that actually helps us to, to think more in the long run. And one uh, very concrete thing that, that Rodrigo was doing with uh, the bank he's working at in Mexico is actually uh, financial education for people. Mm -hmm. So them as a bank using their one of their main competences as an organization, which is around finance and how, how to manage financial resources, to teach their customers to use their financial resources as well, and in the long run to run to be someone who's um, sustaining uh, sustainable in a financial way and who's able to uh, to manage their finances very well. Um, because one of the main reasons why we actually got into the mess of the financial crisis was rooted very much in how individual people would accept or not accept to, to go into a loan mm. relationship, yeah. which finally led to, to very, very long run consequences. So um, maybe as individuals, we can, can also start thinking about how can we actually not only do it ourselves, uh, but also how to, to create kind of a bubble of people who are actually able to think not only in the short run, but actively make decisions in the, mm. the medium and long run as well. Yeah. And I think as well, we saw from Nick's interview, Nick Bishop's interview, um, 
and Nick saw the fact that he uh, left a large bank that is m in many ways uh, involved in all these structures um, and left that and set up his own business. And in a sense, being in charge of your own business, your own destiny, means that you can um, work with other like-minded kind of social movements um, where, where there are other kinds of values going on. So the short-termism is not part of a different kind of alternative movement where you might be interested in sport or well-being or other kinds of business activity that also rooted in kind of other kinds of values. And really then it's about finding alternative modes of doing business that maybe aren't driven in the same uh, short-termist uh, kind of approach. Yeah. And I think Nick's interview brought that out in terms of his choice of collaborators that weren't mm -hmm. necessarily in the same um, <coughs> sphere as, as the bank that he'd been involved in previously. Well, looking also a little bit at the time, uh, we, uh, 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 we don't want to do all the work for the people who are watching. They still need to have some, uh, some connections left uh, uh, that they should make themselves. So, um, and we talked, I think, also already quite a bit about uh, globalization and diversity in, the re in relation to the other themes. So maybe we can move on to uh, uh, the issue of power. Um, and it, again, it relates a little bit to the structure, you know, so th th we talk a lot, and I think also in the MOOC we have quite some material that is about, you know, the tools that you have, uh, collaboration, and uh, sort of this idea of developing partnerships, and this is a lot of the language that you actually see, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I think that a lot of people who are watching this, they will uh, have an experience where as soon as they get into the areas that we are talking about, uh, that very often there's also the possibility of conflict and tensions. Uh, so actually people have values, but they don't necessarily, you know, uh, connect uh, in, into sort of a, a joint uh, goal. So I think that's, maybe you, you cannot call it exactly uh, a connecting theme, but it's sort of a theme that runs through everything that we have seen. Uh, one of the examples that I sort of uh, remember from the interview that I did with uh, Kenne from Tesco uh, is where he talked about the supply chain. And I think that he didn't do that very, he sort of didn't mention that very explicitly. Uh, but if you look back at that interview, he, had, he talked about uh, Tesco and their suppliers. And on the one hand, when sort of discussing this, the, the projects that they were doing uh, in terms of sustainability, uh, he was emphasizing how important it is to uh, actually collaborate with the suppliers. Uh, so you need sort of the knowledge of the suppliers and you need to make that combination in order to develop new solutions. Uh, but he also made remarks that made it quite clear that Tesco, of course, is a very powerful buyer. So if, as a supplier, you don't necessarily have a lot of sort of uh, um, uh, possibilities to actually say no to any company that sort of uh, that you're connected to in that way so in that sense there's also there's collaboration but at the same time there is also the exertion of power i would say um, so uh, that's that's sort of the example that i can think of i don't know if you have any other examples that sort of come to mind and i think what's interesting is there are different forms of power so um Tesco there are exerting commercial power mm -hmm. directly over yeah. the supply chain. But there's other forms of power which are about reputational power and legitimacy. So in something that we're interested in, it's about legitimacy construction. Um, you can see then that it's not always the, the biggest or the mightiest organisation that can exert some influence over a, a dialogue or a, a distributive process mm -hmm. um, because you know, the power then that the NGOs might have or uh, another organisation that has a form of legitimacy that, that they're believed by consumers or believed by um, different parts of, 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 of the system gives them actual power. Mm. So in examples where, say, Friends of the Earth or Greenpeace um, gain gain power really is is in fact that the that that people are interested in what they have to say. So it may not be commercial power, but it may be reputational power influenced yeah. through the media. And of course, the media is a very um, a powerful instrument that that, that is available. Mm -hmm. So I think what's interesting here is there are some really uh, strong structures. 
that are in place that, that sometimes look um, absolutely impossible to break. But then if you also look at some case studies and, and some examples of what different kinds of power exist, um, therefore, mm. when you look at large organizations and small organizations, you have to look quite carefully about where the structures of power reside and, and, and where they originate from. Um, I think that's an important yeah. message for, yeah. our, for yeah. our MOOC. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think what comes to mind there as well as, as another type of how power actually might, uh, might come into play would be what Madeleine Kopp was saying about how important it is for people who want to make responsibility and sustainability happen in a uh, big organization like ITV that they actually start persuade people like to invite them on board to in a certain way exert their power in order to make them part of this uh, kind of sustainability and responsibility venture and these people might actually um, have very different agendas so these people might not from the very beginning want to do, do part of that agenda so persuasion as one time of uh, type of exerting power might be something that on an individual level, as Frank said before, is something that might come into play as well. Maybe not directly from the interviews, but that makes me think <coughs> about some work on institutional entrepreneurs. So there is an ability, a capability that I think is really important to the agenda of responsibility and, and sustainability and ethics, which is a, an ability to um, verbalize and voice uh, a concern which other people feel is an important concern. Um, and thereby enroll other people to that narrative and to that discourse yeah. in a way that doesn't rely on any kind of hi hierarchy. So it may not be the most powerful hierarchical person that is able to articulate a debate or an issue and then enroll others to it. So that's another example mm -hmm. of kind yeah. of uh, yeah. inverting or, or changing, <coughs> taking for granted structures that seem to be too powerful for us, but, but actually changing those, yeah. those yeah. relationships. Well, that's, I would say that's a very nice sort of way to lead in uh, to our last theme, uh, which yes, is yeah. uh, about individual careers, because it would be really nice if, uh, uh, you know, people from our MOOC sort of uh, begin to acquire the skills that actually make them into these institutional entrepreneurs. Uh, and what I really liked about the interviews that we did is that, that I think all of them in one way or another they sort of give information about the themes that we talked about and that we wanted to sort of share information about but at the same time they also give uh, you an insight into how each individual developed into the role that they currently have what was their starting point what were their uh, motivations uh, and you know how that also is quite important in in uh, what they then sort of at this moment are doing in the position that they that they occupy. Um, yeah. And I think that really brings in nicely the the final assignment. That um, so at the very beginning in session one we introduced that assignment and said have a go at applying um, the things that we're going to be talking about to an everyday problem or context mm -hmm. that you might have come across in your everyday life. And what we're wanting people to do now at the end is revisit and redo that assignment with the um, insights of all of our interviewees and the idea of connections and the different tools that we've offered as, as resources during, during the six weeks. And in a way to really think and reflect themselves on some of these issues of power structures, of ethics, responsibility, of environmental sustainability, of the, of the use of technologies or any kind of problem or, or situation that people face themselves and, and really use um, what we've been giving over the last six weeks into redoing that assignment mm -hmm. and seeing then whether um, completing it now uh, looks different to how it looked when it was first done six weeks ago. So I think that, that actually connects very well to uh, um, the kind of skills, abilities, competences that people uh, might develop throughout that MOOC. And, and what uh, Madeleine Kopp was saying before was that you need actually a, a variety of different things you need to be good at in order to actually make that change towards responsibility, sustainability, and ethics happen. Uh, so she was talking about persua persuasion, which we already mentioned. You mentioned before about how influencing and enrolling other people is important. Um, she was talking about technical skills as well. So all of the, the people in their normal jobs, they actually need to be very, very good at what they're doing anyway in order to integrate these topics into their, t into their jobs. Uh, Pia was talking about how important it is for her to make uh, 
ethical good decisions because she's working in an area where these decisions really, really are key to, to how you're behaving. Um, so I think this is one of the, the very important points that, that we can take away and hopefully that people got out of this move. And I think as well, um, another link to Lynn Prime's interview um, and, the, and the way she talked about AstraZeneca is when you have a very large organization, you have a division of labor almost with different kinds of skills and competencies. So she was saying, you know, if you come from a very a technical background and you're in the technical side of environmental impact and um, or from her side, she came in via a language and communications and, and she called them the softer skills. But in a sense, the, the interdisciplinarity of, of uh, the work we're doing on the MOOC shows that you can have a multiple background of different kinds of competencies and that in a way they, they connect at some level yeah. um, and, and they're all very relevant, um, complete a plethora of different kinds of skills and competencies are relevant to this field. Yeah. Okay, well that sort of rounds it up I would say. We have uh, shown you a number of connections uh, that, that we uh, uh, can make in the material and that's of course based on our own histories and our own sort of uh, expertise. Uh, and you can sort of do the same thing uh, with the material based on your your own situation and where you are. And I think that, I mean, that, that would also be the way that I would summarize, I think, uh, the way to work with connections. Yeah? So uh, once you start to see the bigger picture, you see a lot of connections and it can be overwhelming almost in the sense that, you know, the individuals and the organization and the global problems, you know, it's all connected. Uh, but what I think that we've also sort of indicated through a number of examples and what you can see in the interviews is that people when they are sort of, you know, uh, when they make some, some progress and they sort of are in one way or another successful in dealing with these situations, it's by simply starting from the point where they are at that moment. Uh, and from that point uh, they develop it, so they take the problem that they have or the opportunity that they have and they start looking at how it spills over into other areas, uh, how they might involve their suppliers or their consumers or even other stakeholders into that. So in a way they make, they make the system bigger and through that they uh, sort of work towards a solution. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that would be my way of sort of summarizing uh, uh, one of the, the, the core principles that we have been trying to uh, to work with in this MOOC uh, and hopefully that has also been something that is inviting for you to do uh, because what we try to do in this MOOC is basically to uh, uh, to provide a platform for you to start learning the skills and competences to do this kind of work to make these connections uh, also to have some experience with uh, with doing that through the assignment, uh, through looking at the interviews and sort of working with it in your own uh, practical situation. Uh, and finally, hopefully also by making connections to other people who are uh, participating in the MOOC uh, and maybe also sharing the material with other people in your own context. Uh, and in that way, building up a network uh, that will help you, you know, after you art after you have looked at the material of this MOOC a number of times, uh, that you can still sort of work with it and improve your skills and competences. Because that network of people is something that uh, you can uh, continue to work with. It doesn't end with this MOOC. Um, I think that's what we wanted to share with you. Uh, I can only say that I really enjoyed it a lot to uh, work with Sally and with Oliver and also with the people behind the cameras uh, to uh, make this, uh, uh, this work. Uh, so I thank you very much for uh, being a part of this and we wish you all the best in whatever uh, you are going to do with this material.